the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ah, uh, the big questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from, and where am I going? What is worthy of my life? At the movie theater, what armrest is yours? Do stairs go up and go down? If parents say, never take candy from a stranger, why do we celebrate Halloween? If someone who is mute swears, does their mother wash their hands with soap? If my body re if, am I me if my body regenerates every seven years? Okay, but I digress a little bit. Anyway... Now, the more serious of these questions can be answered only by asking another question. Whose am I? Or in other words, to what or to whom do I belong? How many of you ever heard of the husband calling contest at the Illinois State Fair? In order to win the prize, the wife shoves two fingers in her mouth and whistles sharply and wails something like, Timmy! Or, Georgie! Right? One winger is declared, declared that her husband always responds, and that's why they have such a good marriage. Husband calling was combined with the fair's hawk calling contest, you know, a practical skill for farmers who enter the competition. One participant said, you know, I, call, I do call my kill, kid, pigs twice a day to feed them, and they do respond. They're very smart. Now, I don't know whose idea it was to combine hog calling and husband calling together, nor would I dare to comment on the relative merits of these pastimes. Kind of like when we were kids, right? Suddenly, over the din of things, somebody would call our name. Of course, you knew whoever that somebody was, you knew you were in trouble when you had all three of your names, right? Time to come home, they would say. Strangers rarely calls out our name. Only people to whom we are important calls out our names. So what a magnificent idea it is that, according to Isaiah, the creator of the universe calls our name. That means that we're known, right? It means that we are loved. So don't let anybody say that their lives don't matter. The matter, the Lord of creation has called our name and has said, you belong to me. You know, Noah, you are mine. There's a flood coming. Build an ark. Abraham and Sarah, you are mine. Leave your home and I'll lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. And I will make of, of your descendants a great nation. And it will be a light to all. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, you are mine. You're not going to be called heel grabber or conniver or trickster anymore. No, no, you are now called Israel, which means the one who contends, who wrestles, who strives with God. A voice from the burning bush said, Moses, you are mine. Go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Mary. You are mine. You will conceive by the Holy Spirit, and you will bear the Son of God. Joseph, Joseph, you are mine. But don't divorce Mary, because her baby has 
been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And when the baby is born, you're going to name him Jesus. And he will save the people from their sin-sick souls. Who are we? Whose are we? And how are we supposed to live? And why doesn't God answer us by talking to us like he spoke in biblical times to Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Moses and Mary and Joseph? Well, our faith story is like what the Celtic tradition calls the thin places or the thin spaces where the heavenly penetrates the earthly. Those times when, where people experience moments of a deep sense of God's presence. When people see the light, if you will, or, or hear the voice. When they trust and obey what is revealed to them. I mean, the Apostle Paul used the image of a veil that makes our minds hardened. You know, he says that with Christ, that veil is pulled back. And when that happens, we are able to see the light of God in Christ. We are able to hear the voice of God in Christ. You know, when the biblical witnesses talk about the glory of God, they are professing their faith. They're saying to us, you know, that, that stuff we've seen, that's God. Oh, you know, we can't prove it. We can only testify to what we have experienced and how it has affected us. You know, today is known as the baptism of our Lord. And it is included in the season of Epiphany because this baptism is one of those little thin spaces where heaven and earth meet. It's where the veil is pulled back so that we might be able to see and hear the truth about Jesus. And when we see and we hear the truth about Jesus, we become aware of the truth about ourselves. Now, in Matthew's account of Jesus' baptism, Jesus is drawn to John. And, and Matthew knows, knows that this is going to puzzle us like no, no ending because John is telling sinners to repent of their sins. So why on earth would the innocent one, the pure one, need to be baptized by John. So here's John baptizing one person after another, after another, after another in the Jordan, right? He's going to baptize next, next, next. And then, whoa, he sees Jesus. And he says to him, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. To John's protest, what does Jesus say? He says, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Okay. What does righteousness mean? I mean, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, if you didn't know, were considered, well, by themselves and others, to be the most righteous people on earth. They sought to keep the laws 248 thou shalt and the 365 thou shalt not. They studied and they learned and the, they kept the 613 regulations that their religion taught them would make them righteous. And, G, and here is Jesus saying, well, their right, uh, our righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. Well, how? Well, later in Matthew's gospel, Jesus will answer the question posed by the Pharisee. He said, who asked him, well, which commandment is the greatest? Because I guess when you've got 613 commandments to keep, you might need some help prioritizing them in some way, shape, or form. So Jesus responded. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second, though, is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. So what do these two commandments upon which all the law and the prophets hang tell us about God's righteousness? Well, they tell us that, right, that righteousness is our submission to God's will. God's will is that we love God with all that we are and that we love each other as ourselves. Sounds pretty simple. I mean, it ultimately means that love is not so much an answer as it is a relationship. See, God's love for us is expressed by becoming one with us, by identifying with us, by entering into solidarity with us, so that Jesus, so that Jesus 100% fully knows the life that we know. And, and he willingly suffers with and for those whom God loves. You see, Jesus is God's epiphany, God's appearance, God's revelation, because he sheds light on the truth. And the truth is God cannot be contained by 613 do's and don'ts. Holy love is a lot messier than that. God's love, it colors outside the lines, if you will. So when, when Jesus submitted to John's baptism, the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit dove descended. And the voice from heaven declared the truth about Jesus to all of space and all of time. This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And on that day in the River Jordan, yeah, there's one of those thin places, those thin spaces where the heaven and the earth met. And the veil was pulled back. And the truth was seen. The truth was heard. That was true for Jesus, and that is true for all of us. On God's behalf, the church, when it baptizes God's children, it declares God's truth about them. It says to every child, to every young person, to every adult that is baptized, this is God's child. This is God's beloved. And this child, this young person, this adult, brings God pleasure. See, when we know who God, that know who God, who loves us and who enjoys us, there's a light that glows within us, that shines through us, that simply can never be extinguished. A light that shines in and through us out into the world's darkness. And the world's darkness can never, ever put that light out. My family in the faith, we, all of us, have been called by God. And God is with us. God is with us, holding our hands, keeping us from falling. And God has called us, called all of us, to be a shining light of hope for a dark and dying world. Amen.